sense. And in connection to iHeart, many of us have been talking about the impact of the snow melt and the you know ice melt on the biology and other things. So, which is where it's it's really great to have a perspective from your your side on the impact um, that you see in the Arctic. Um, Dr. Greg Meyer is a fellow of the American Association of, for the Advancement of Science, a recipient of the International Arctic Science Committee Medal. And it was interesting to see that you were also appointed to the US Arctic Research Commission by President Clinton. Lots of great mm -hmm. accolades in there. And then Dr. Lee Cooper serves internationally as the chair of the Marine Working Group of the International Arctic Science Committee. He's got tons of peer reviewed publications in many. Uh, important venues such as science, nature, and National Academies of Science. So it's really great to have you. Both. All right, great. Thank you. thanks. Thank um, you. I'm going to start. Uh, I'm more the chemist in the family. Uh, we're, we're married, uh, so we're a dual career couple. Um, and we, as, as was mentioned, we're we're at the Chesapeake Biological Lab. So it's where the mighty Patuxent River enters Chesapeake Bay. So if you get down far that south, that's where we are. And uh, we'd we'd love to have you come by. It's it's part of the University of Maryland system, to, as you are. Um, we do go out to sea. A couple. We have two cruises this coming year coming up. We we'll go out in July on a Canadian Coast Guard ship, which we've done for about twenty five years now. Every year, almost every year, uh, and that's our project. The, the distributed biological observatory is what it's become. So it's a it's kind of a, a we we emphasize people wanted to call it the Distributed environmental observatory. It's called distributed because different. We we a lot of the work is shipboard, and we depend on other countries. So um, when you think of where the Arctic is, where the Bering Sea is, uh, a lots of ships from other countries go through the Bering Strait too that have an interest in science. And it's maybe something, but China, uh, Korea, Japan, Canada, in past years Russia also have all sent scientists north and pass through this body of water, the Bering Strait, and going into the main Arctic Ocean. And because of that, uh, it's so expensive. Uh, we the, the second cruise we'll have this year is on the Sekuliak, which is a National Science Foundation-owned ship, but it costs about $65,000 a year to use the ship. A day. A, a day. I mean, excuse me, oh. a, a day to use the ship. Uh, and. Um, um, so it's very expensive to do the oceanographic research that we do. And so when other countries decide to send their ships up, that's great because we can share the costs and the and also the expertise and the knowledge of all the scientists participating. So the distributed biological observatory is really an international program to assess how the Arctic is changing in terms of, of climate. And so we collect physical data and we know from satellites, of course, that things are changing rapidly in the Arctic. But our emphasis is a little further down the ecosystem. Is how is it affecting, say, the walruses, the gray whales, all the other organisms that are up there? So I'll we'll give you I'll give you a little bit of the background of the program, and then Jack will talk a little bit more about the uh, the actual uh, science that we're doing uh, in terms of the ecosystem. And, um, I think I'll use the mouse. It's like that Star Trek. Uh, that Star Trek, early Star Trek, yeah. well, that's use, right. use the mouse. So, <laughs> so here's a map. Here's a map of of, of the area that we work in. We're very close to the, the border between the United States and Russia, uh, and also we use a Canadian ship, and that Canadian ship is actually going in the Canadian Arctic. And we kind of hitch a ride on it every year. Um, what is thought is that the system is really going to change uh, uh, as sea ice disappears. So right now. Uh, when the sea ice melts, there's lots of algae and plants in that that fall to the bottom of the ocean. It's rather shallow. You can see where all that white is in the ocean. That's all continental shelf. So it's 50, 60, 70 meters deep. It's not very deep water. So it's very easy for all of that material to get all the way to the bottom. And so the bottom of the Bering and the Chukchi Seas, and it's of interest to the United States because these are the largest continental shelves the United States has shares with Russia um, in, in, that, in that area, that it's all very rich. The animals that feed on the benthos include things like walruses and gray whales that swim to the bottom and pick up the animals that are on the bottom and eat them and forage on them. 
Uh, when all that ice disappears, then we're going to have a different system. Uh, it's going to be what we call pelagic dominated. It's going to have more fish in it. And we've seen this more recently as when the sea ice is retreated, uh, we start seeing more and more fish that are found further south. The Bering Sea people talk about it. So it's the breadbasket of the United States in terms of that's our biggest fishery, is, but it's in the southeast Bering Sea and where we work is in the northern Bering Sea and into the Chukchi Sea, which is the, the part of the Arctic Ocean that's just north of Bering Strait. Um, so this is a typical food web currently. Uh, their bowheads are ice, ice adapted whales. They're only found in polar regions, so they like ice and they have a thick um, uh, swelling on their head so they can bump their, uh, they can make a hole in the ice uh, about this thick uh, so that they're not bothered at all. Um, walruses and gray whales, as I mentioned, feed on the bottom. Uh, and then there are other organisms. So the, the polar bears, feed on the ring seals, which feed on the Arctic cod, which feed on the sea ice algae. So it's a very short food web. Uh, and so material that gets made in the water ends up on the bottom or in the water column very quickly. And so that brings me to um, the, the distributed biological observatory and what, what we've observed uh, going back when we started doing this uh, in the late 1980s, uh, was that there were places there that are very rich. They have lots of, you You, you bring up a, a scoop off the bottom and it's full of clams or other organisms. And so uh, some of the, some areas are richer than others. And we identified some places for so all the red boxes are places where there's a lot of either biodiversity or a lot of biomass. And if you put a scoop down on the bottom, you pull up lots of things. Um, and so when we started developing this and talking to the Canadians who have this ship that we that sails up here and into the Canadian Arctic every year, we started talking about, well, we want to sample all of these places. So we do a little detour of the ship's course, which would otherwise go up through here uh, in the in, in the Arctic uh, and make the and, and occupy these sites every year. And we do it in July. Um, so that's when that when the ice is clear enough that the ship can make it all the way to the into the Canadian Arctic, where they do things like putting up channel markers and buoy tending and things like that. So the ship has a mission that Canada needs to have it do, uh, but they don't mind taking us along. And we have Canadian scientists, so it's a joint U.S. Canadian uh, project, and it, we we named it the Distributed Biological Observatory because, as I mentioned in the beginning, we got other countries involved. So the crew, we're, we're going to go to Korea actually next month to talk to Korean scientists about an expansion of the DBO concept, is what we call it, uh, in the, into areas that are further north uh, to the north and west in international waters north of Russia. Um, so all these other countries have gotten involved, and so that's why it's distributed. We emphasize it's biological because it's actually fairly easy by comparison to collect the data you need to demonstrate the, how salty the water, how warm it is, you can fly a satellite over it and see where the ice is. Uh, all of those things are, I'm not trivializing it, but it, it's it's easier to measure than the impacts on the, on the biology. So um, that's why we call it the Distributed Biological Observatory. Uh, so these are the things we agreed on, all of the countries that are participating in this. Is, well, let's measure the temperature, the salinity, the current flow, what's in the in the water column, the plankton that are available, what are the animals living on the bottom. Uh, we want to, the seabirds and marine mammals are a big part of uh, the energetics and, and the interest of people in the Arctic. Uh, so let's keep track of how many of those there are out there and what species. Uh, we want to know whether they're fish moving north or not that might be commercially fish. And every once in a while, maybe trawl the bottom to see what's on the bottom that you can't get from the grabs. And then we've also added, um, I know this is a big data forum that you're all working in that business. Um, so we have uh, started to get in the 21st century and collect large amounts of data also using gliders, moorings, the sail drone is a, a autonomous sailboat uh, that they can develop that goes out and collects data also with solar panels on it. And as well as the satellite observations and and 
we've agreed to share data. So we have a data sharing protocol. These are just some pictures too here. Uh, the zooplankton nets. This is the graph that we use to uh, send down to the bottom, to pick up those clams that are down there. And that's a CTD. So that's a conductivity temperature depth device. All the gray bottles collect the water. So we, we take water out of that and measure nutrients or bring it home or we do it at sea, measure chlorophyll. But there's electronic sensors on that. So every few, uh, many times a second, it'll tell you what the salinity of the water is, what the temperature is. So we do come off the ship with quite a bit of data. It's um, uh, something that, that that's a standard tool. Um, and then this is just an example of what NASA is contributing to this is to looking at um, uh, what can we see from space uh, uh, in, in terms of the distributions of uh, chlorophyll, uh, where the sea ice is, uh, and how that's changing over time. Um, and then we have a colleague we work with on this DBO who's at Clark University in um, Massachusetts, who's a remote sensing and also an, an optic specialist. So she comes out to see and measures how far uh, into the water column light penetrates, and that has a lot of influence on what organisms are in the water column. Uh, and she is also using remote sensing data. And this is it's a pretty complicated graph. I was kind of rubbing my eyes looking at it last night, but these are the separate areas that we're analyzing that we do on this cruise every. July. So the box number one, two, three, four, and five are the ones we occupy from this Canadian ship. Uh, and these are the numbers. So upper left hand corner is, is what we call DBO1, this one here. So DBO2 is here, DBO3, and so forth. And so those are all of those. And those are the trends in sea ice coverage. Uh, and they're color coded. So the red. Uh, the red line corresponds to the mean annual persistence in number of days of sea ice in that little red box uh, that's up there on the map. And you can see in a lot of cases there, wherever there's a line drawn, there's a significant trend. Uh, and there's also and and the persistence is driven by two things. One is the ice is melting earlier in the in the spring, and the other thing is it's coming back later in the fall. So it, particularly the the uh, Formation of sea ice has really declined. So, uh, on day 350 at DBO3, which is the area just north of Bering Strait, uh, so day 350, so ice isn't forming anymore. Sorry, I'm I, 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 I forgot to turn the phone. On. And it's probably a span. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, so, those are the that's that's the overall trend. So just like in the rest of the Arctic, sea ice is disappearing, uh, going away, and it's due to sea ice forming much later than it used to, and sea ice breaking up much earlier than it used to. Um, so in the talk I had with the, we had with the students just a few minutes ago, we we mentioned oxygen eighteen, oxygen sixteen. So this is one of the things we measure in our lab in Solomon's is. What's the ratio in these? Um, and I, I wasn't sure about adding this, but now I think uh, it, it was worthwhile doing because uh, analyzing the uh, the ice composition of what happens to to sea ice when it melts is it looks a lot uh, from the basis of salinity like fresh water, but we also have a great deal of fresh water coming off the land surface, uh, and the oxygen eighteen oxygen sixteen ratio can tell you what proportion of that water came from river runoff. So in this case, this is the fraction of runoff in the surface water. The red uh, is 14 to 21% of the, of the uh, surface water is fresh, and it came from river runoff based on the oxygen 18-16 ratio. And we see the fraction of sea ice that's melted. Uh, actually, it's, in this particular year, it wasn't wasn't particularly strong. Most of this stuff doesn't look like it has melted sea ice in it at all. This is in August, September, so the ice is gone by then. Uh, and there's only a few places. Oh, and I, and I think I had this parallel with, with another graph from another year when there was more sea ice 
but in this case, this was a pretty sea ice free year and everything that's out there that's fresh water came off of rivers instead of uh, off of uh, melted sea ice. So that's one thing we do. Um, this is, uh, and I've also, we are also using the oxygen 18, oxygen 16 ratio to look at fresh water flowing north from the Pacific Ocean uh, from the Bering Sea through Bering Strait. This is Bering Strait uh, on a nice day. It's not normally this nice, so get out and take pictures on when the weather's nice. This is Little Diomede Island. So this is the American island. And then this is the Russian island, Big Diomede or Rat Admiral Ratmanov. And then that's the Asian mainland, so the most eastern portion of, of, uh, of uh, Asia there. Uh, I've got a paper here that was uh, written by uh, a, a woman, uh, uh, Rebecca Woodgate at the University of Washington, and she measures the flow of water through this using autonomous devices, a thing called a mooring. And I'll show you a picture, I think, on the next slide of what this looks like. Um, it's got a, a railroad wheel at the bottom, so real heavy to keep it anchored. Uh, and then some devices, a, a release to let this thing off the bottom when you come back for it in a year, and then recording devices measuring uh, things like how acidic is the ocean, uh, what's the current flow, uh, what's the salinity and temperature. And it's doing that all winter because we're not there, on the weather's not that nice 99% of the time. Um, so this thing is anchored in the bottom of the ocean there in Bering Strait, measuring the water flow and the characteristics of it throughout the year. And she only has, it's expensive, so she only has three of these. There's one in Russian waters and it really isn't operating anymore uh, and hasn't been for a number of years. And then, so this, this one here, the A3 mooring is supposed to uh, correspond to water across the whole uh, strait. And then A4 catches fresh water that's flowing along the Alaskan coast or relatively fresh water. And then this one, and here are the two islands, the American island, the Russian island, and the Russian mainland. So I think I'd better speed up, but this is just a quick, a quick view of some of the, what we consider big data. Uh, and it's a change in the oxygen 18, oxygen 16 ratio uh, over time. Uh, and you can see that the red, uh, the red dots correspond to data that's been collected more recently. So the, this data, these data were collected starting in 1987. So the green ones are 1980s. 1990s, and then I shifted to a red color. All right. <laughs> Push the button on the left, on the right. Turn it off. <laughs> um, and what we realize is is that in addition to that that um, um, that mooring that's collect data, we can help validate it using this oxygen 18, oxygen 16 ratios, because just about all the water in all of these places that are south of Barrick Street because of the, the, the northward flow of water, it's gonna end up up here in the Arctic Ocean. And we can use that as a gauge of how much fresh water is flowing through Bering, through, through Bering Strait uh, in, in that um, flow of water. And, and the, here I've plotted it by year going back to 1987. Uh, and so the, the redder ones are the, are the more recent uh, uh, samples. And you can see there's been a change. And it's proportional to the freshwater flow through the strait as you go north. Um, and we took these numbers and compared them with the estimates from the moorings. Uh, and it's not perfect, but rem remember that our samples come from all kinds of places in, in that whole map. And the moored samples that are collected electronically um, don't, um, don't perhaps represent everything either. Um, so, but there's a, there's a relatively good match. So this is the kind of thing we're, we're, we're trying to do in terms of look at the chemistry. And here's some, uh, just a few other examples of, of things that we collect. So the, these are water column from DB01. So the most Southern one, by the time we get up there, the water is what we call stratified. It's all, this, this is salinity, uh, and the nutrients and the nutrients are all at depth. So all the colors, this, the, the, the top of the, uh, the water, you can see it's about 80 meters deep here. You can't probably see that, but I'll tell you. <laughs> and this, these are the locations of the stations, the St. Lawrence Island, 
Um, so this particular station, by the time we get there every July, the water column is very stratified. There's no more chlorophyll in the water at the surface. It's all a depth, uh, and um, and so the the and the colors relate to how little nutrients are at the surface and and that they're all. And we make these measurements over the whole water column, and you can see that this DBO1 area, it's actually pretty low. It's north of Bering Strait, where all that rich water with all the nutrients in it flows through and all the material settles out. That's always the place where the chlorophyll is the highest. And then these are trends in chlorophyll over time, and this is Karen Fry's work uh, using satellite imagery and I think the main point is in the area that we work where those boxes are, we haven't seen a big change. The big changes are where the green slashes are and we're not sampling there. We didn't 30 years ago, didn't set up the right spots to catch that. Um, but the, the gist of this, and this is the satellite record. Uh, and then when we compare that with the actual data we've collected over the years from 2000 to 2020, we don't actually see any trends in chlorophyll, so it, it confirms what the satellites show is that production is going up as the sea ice retreats. There's more light reaching the ocean surface, more chlorophyll can bloom, uh, but we're not seeing a trend in, the, in these DBO areas. And um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jackie. This was a, a, a part of the project. She, you can explain what sediment traps are. and. Uh, they're little buckets that are out there all year round collecting uh, material. I put you on airplane mode. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Well, I'm getting mine so I can just make sure I have time. So I just wanted uh, to go through the um, the water column area. I would say something, although seasonally in July you don't see the carbon export, it's broader than that. It is the main areas that we still have a lot of uh, carbon export in the system. So even though the production may be high in other parts of the of the area, by the time it gets down to the bottom, it's settling in these hot spots areas. Now, what we have is these sediment traps there. It's an instrument that goes onto the moorings. It time series collections, the carbon coming out of the of system. And because we are in an ice covered one, this trap is sitting just off the bottom about eight meters above all the other physical ocean arpies. So it's one trap. When you go into the basin, oftentimes the Japanese will put out multiple trap, maybe two or three to be able to see stratification. But on this one, any higher than that, it could be taken away by the ice. But what we're seeing that you're looking at from latitude from DBO 2, 3, and 4, you see the ice cover, and when it goes away in the summertime here, and then when it comes back, and then it, you can see the chlorophylls primarily uh, from in the south is pretty high. That's the DBO 2 south of the Bering Strait. And you could progressively go north you get lower values as you get up to the DBO4. It happens to be the area that has the highest amount of sea ice. Uh, so we just have a reduced number of days in which you can have production. And you can see that it comes back again in, uh, in the spring period. At the same time, it's also uh, collecting some of the zooplankton. So there's the big nets we talked about you can look at, but inside of these uh, carbon export are also the plankton, different species that you don't really need to to know about, but the main thing is coming from the south to the north, you see the displacement. That's because this kind of relates to the ice. As you move north, it's starting to get warmer and you're getting growth factors going on. So that a lot of the zooplankton further north in the system is happening in August and September, whereas here it was in July period uh, further south. And the marrow plankton are the young from the bivalves and times that I, I'm interested in. They release their young into the water as larvae and then they settle out. Some animals actually, they have young, live young that crawl around and take advantage of habitats. But you can see this displacement same way. These guys are coming out in July, July and August, and then later in the spring as you, as you head north. And then you get why, how we built the DBO is we built it on the longest living uh, time series that we have, and that is, uh, these animals, they live 30, 40, or 50 years, the animals, the macrofauna and the sediments. Bowheads can live 150 years, but they migrate back and forth. So what these are showing the patterns over four decades of samples, we had big process cruises. Uh, these are combined with other people's cruises. 
And then these, that's why we built these boxes in these high, high hotspot areas. And you can see this all the way up to about 2015, which means it went to about 2012. As we built the DBO, we started with these ones and then expanded as we could get more vessels working in the, to the Northeast. And the color coded, the hotter the color, the higher the biomass there. And then if you look at the, uh, oops. And now this is just the last decade's worth. And now you've got the, the boxes here, uh, the different DBO indicators there, and it's color coded by the dominant animals. Clams are dominant here. I point out these because I'm going to mention these are worms. You said, who cares? Well, a lot of commercial fisheries, they feed off the bottom one and they like to eat clams and they particularly like to eat worms. Walruses like to eat clams. Up here, the pinks are amphipods. They're like shrimps like you would eat on your, your dinner table. Uh, gray whales really like those They're the ones that live in the sediment. And then you move up to, to bivalve land up here color coded by the amount. So here you're down at about 10 or 20 grams carbon. You're up here about 200. It gives you the relationship of how productive the animals are there. They're just feeding on whatever comes down. So it's that carbon that's deposited there and the fresh phytoplankton that they're, they're, they're using and uh, growing. And then the reason why the colors move and change as you go to the coast, that's Alaska coastal water, low nutrients, low production after the first spring bloom. Here, it's like a chemostat. We keep bringing nutrients in through Bering Strait. You can grow a lot of organic carbon and then it deposits. You'll notice the color start to change as you move up into the Northeast. Again, there's a front between the brown and the, and the yellow dots, and that has to do with the water mass type. And that drives then what nutrients are there and where the phytoplankton is. So these are the footprints that built the DBO. And these are the, some of the key cast of characters from clams that the, uh, the walrus is like, the gray whales migrate from California to eat on these amphipods here. Fish like to eat a lot of these uh, smaller worm type organisms. So just a few of the case studies. Why we started off with our, our longest time series south of St. Lawrence Island. We were at a meeting here in Washington and the sea ice people got up and talked about how the ice was starting to pull back and all of that, but then they, happened to have find uh, one of the uh, this threatened seabird here it had recorders on it and it started to beep. So they sent a fixed plane out and behold and behold, there are three to 400,000 of these birds. They were in that Polynia, which is an open area and ice covered sea. They do their breeding behavior there. So they, uh, the males are the ones with the, with the white and the brown and the females are the browner ones. And so they feed off of these clams and that was where the world population of these eiders, they, they, they nest out on Alaska and Russia, but they can't come here to feed and to breed. And so one of the reasons why they're able to have such a high biomass there because of this cold pool here that forms when there's ice. So if the sea ice pulls back like it did in 270, it never produced any brine. This cold pool went away and I'll show you how the fish came in. So they're, they're primed to come north and this has some issues with societal issues with subsistence hunters versus commercial fisheries. But for the time being, we are built, we still have a cold pool there. The interesting fact is that we, you are what you eat and acidification is becoming an issue. Ocean acidification, what happens is the pH is going lower, more CO2 pumped into the bottom of the ocean. Some of these clams are susceptible to their shells dissolving and that's having an impact on prey for these organisms. So this extension of the tie-in between sea ice and this cold pool is pretty critical for the, the whole ecosystem there. So that's one of the reasons why we put it in that location. What we're seeing on the time series is an overall decline in that biomass. And what it is is a population, I would point out at 35 grams carbon for those who like to do wet weight and then but you probably are not, maybe not into that, it's like three, four, 400 uh, wet weight grams if you were to weigh it. Um, but the top one is the overall for the station Live owls are what are driving it. So the further north, you still have some, uh, but the declines happened about 2015 and 16, you can see, and that's the prey base for these for these eiders. And at the same time that you're declining in some of these bivalves, except a little bit now over here, different species, is these worms are coming in. And those are the worms that the uh, commercial fish like to eat. 
So as we build that time series out, um, we then expanded that. Okay, so what's happening is we're seeing a contraction of some of the key ag organisms further north in that system, similar to what we're seeing in north of Bering Strait. So this is just an example of some of the time series. Lee already showed some nutrients, temperature, salinity, oxygen, fluorescence. So that gives you an indication of chlorophyll. And this is Bering Strait that Lee was mentioning here, moving up latitudinally and then near the coast. So this area is the richest area. We tack, we put these stations as close to the Russian date line as we could. When we were working with our Russian colleagues, so we could go all the way into this system, but that hasn't happened since 2012. Um, to be able to work with our over on the Russian side. The red on the right, that's Alaska coastal water, warm water, low nutrients, less ice. And then you can see the salinity with the hotter colors offshore. That's the Pacific water that's flowing into this whole system. And this is that high chlorophyll biomass. It's a fluorescence uh, subsurface happening in this, these offshore sites. So what does that do for the animals underneath? Uh, similar type of thing, you can see this is the offshore site here. We're now seeing increases. So there's a lot more organic carbon. We are getting higher production with the pullback of sea ice earlier in the season. And this is uh, the resulting from the sea ice duration is lower, increased productivity, and particularly in this region here, which is high silt and clay. So you live in the community that you're, you're growing and for a benthic system, if it's a sediment grain size. So we track that also. We look at the carbon content, but we also, if you're in a coarser sediment, certain animals don't like to live there, just like they don't, uh, people don't like to live in certain communities, other ones will come in. And so we're seeing this, this transition of uh, whole communities by changes in current flow and sea ice extent. Now, this is what usually people in the public are interested in, because these are what makes it into NOVA and, and the news are the big benthic foragers and their response to uh, climate change. And, but they're there because they're looking for food. They either transit 4,000 kilometers from Baja, California, the gray whales, or they're migrating north and south, like uh, walruses with the sea ice extent. So gray whales are shifting their distribution. So, and that's, tied directly with sea ice. So it's related to how much prey they're going after, uh, you know, they, they're benthic feeders, but they can also go after what are euphosids, a thrill like we have in the Antarctic, euphosids, a, a common name. They're near the bottom and they'll scoop them up. So they're now switch hitting between feeding on the benthos and also feeding on the water column. So they will opportunistically take bulk, bulk feeding. This is a story of the ducks I was mentioning, sea ice again. These animals spend more energy if they're in the water than if they're sitting on ice. So sea ice is directly tied to the quality of this habitat for them. The same thing for these guys, walruses, they lose the loss of their platform. So when their ice retreats earlier, they're going with it and they tend to be carried over their feeding cafeteria that would, they would normally feed at because the ice would stall and then they dive down. They have their pups with them and they're riding the ice up. And when the ice is completely gone, which is happening now, they have to go fall out on the coast and they have to then travel like two weeks to be able to get out and feed more energy. So they're getting, these guys are getting less bang for their buck as are these, depending on uh, what happens with the access. And that has to do with the sea ice. So one of these, uh, again, just to mention, at the same way we were seeing a contraction of the clams south of St. Lawrence Island, we're seeing a contraction of their food base for these gray whales. They're going further north because the ice isn't there, but they're also going further north looking for prey base uh, of food. And so um, both of these, are, this is an, a threatened species here. And uh, I don't know, I don't think they've listed the gray whales on it, but it is having a change in their migration thing about the gray whales is that there's been an unusual mortality event and they've been over the last couple of years, NOAA has put in place why they're dying. They're dying all the way up the coastline. Uh, and the question is probably tied to what's looking like is uh, prey base. So what's happening? So that ties in uh, with what our, uh, what work we've been doing. Uh, the other important thing when you, when you build these time series, and this is one for our uh, work just for the last decade, these are now what gray whales feed on. 
these are the small crustaceans. Uh, this is a paper, a paper work with Sue Moore, who's a marine mammalogist at the University of Washington. And what we're seeing is that a change in the plate, the abundance of these animals for these gray whales to feed on. So it's contracting north. They're going to go further north to feed. And actually, you can see the bright reds up by the northeast check you see. Now, these animals, not only are the gray whales there, but their relatives, the subarctic species, the humpback whale, the killer whales, those are coming into the system because the waters are warmer. And on the right, what you're seeing, this is gray whales just indicated here, but there are maps like this. This whole area is having a cacophony of different whales now. Some of them that they are subsistence hunters preference, other ones that killer whales are going after gray whale calves. So there's a lot more interaction going on with this ice pullback. But for humanity, for us, the society, it's this information where these whales are and when for um, looking increased ship strikes. Because without the sea ice, you're having more transport. Uh, it's a lot less expensive to go from Europe to Asia over the pole than it is to go through the Panama Canal. And so now uh, the Coast Guard is designating shipping lanes and what limitations on transport because of the migration patterns of some of these big mammals. So our data that was brought in with Sue is being brought forward into some of those uh, decision modes. So people, um, food security is, is a big issue uh, in the Arctic. Uh, subsistence food for the locals, but also it ties in with commercial fishing, uh, which, which is what, like Lee mentioned, is the bread and butter basket of the Bering Sea. But uh, fishermen are looking for where those stocks and they're moved, they are moving north. Um, so they're feeding on, local people are feeding on seabirds, marine mammals. Uh, they eat the invertebrates, the tunicates, which can be other crabs, clams, fish that come up by storms or inside the, these animals, or they go out and fish. Um, what we're seeing now is what you've probably heard in the news in other places, these harmful algal blooms. It's a type of dinoflagellate, it's toxic and it causes red tides. It's happening on the, in the Atlantic, it's happening in the Gulf, it's happening in the Pacific, and now it's happening in the Arctic. And so what we try to do in uh, many of these programs to try to interface with coastal communities. And also last year, they had to have the health department tell them that not to feed on certain things at certain times, like just like we do in the lower 48. Commercial fisheries, uh, Pollock and Pacific carp are big fisheries that we have in the US uh, is expanding northward with warm water. And the other thing is we have contaminants. So plastics is a big deal. Not the plastics from people who live there, it's the plastics that are being transported into the, into the system. And the microplastics, all those uh, tiny, tiny bees that were done for cosmetics and other things, they're, they're, they're in the water, but they don't get, they don't dissolve. And then they become, they're, they're finding them in zooplankton, they're finding them in fish. So particularly harmful algal blooms, because there's a whole network now, we share, collect data that provides to the network. They do the toxicity studies, the bright red, you can see where they found them uh, in the water column, but also in the sediments, because these particular species, they settle out, they form cysts, they overwinter, they come back out when the water's warm, they bloom, and then the animals feed on the next spring. So on this, you can see what's happened. This is the September period, and this is the March from 1978 to 2002 of sea ice. Uh, overall, this is for Walt Meyer at, uh, in Colorado there. I think he's in Colorado now. Um, but you can see how dramatic it is. And it's on this trajectory continued downwards. So is this reduction of sea ice and warming of seawater that's uh, influencing these, these blooms and uh, the health issue that, is, that the coastal communities are dealing with now. Uh, just another example. I've, so these are where we did, they did the analysis, what we collected, these are hot. These are above EPA standards here. And you can see the orange and the reds are where those clams, they accumulate. These clams, like I said, are living 10 to 30 or 40 years. They're feeding off of the water column as well as the surface sediments. Cysts are in the surface sediments. Near bottom is also the dinoflagellates as they settle out. And so this is what is a, of concern. There's been one death. That was down in the Aleutians down here of uh, eating off of a, a contaminated snail, actually. The other thing is that it's moving up the food chain, and that's what you're seeing here. 
uh, not as much, no reds yet, but this is now in the walruses and the bowhead whales because the bowheads are living 150 years, walruses are 30, 40, 50 years, and they are consuming right off at lower food levels. The other thing, as I mentioned, was ocean acidification. This is one of our past PhD students who's now uh, at St. Mary's as an assistant professor, uh, Christina Gainville. Uh, these are the key food, but she was studying, uh, she's looking at stress factors. So there'll be winners and losers. Some of them have thicker shells. They're going to, they're surviving when she did her acidification experiments or stress and other ones are not. And so that's what's happening is you're moving different species in. And that it has a population that goes all the way up, up the food chain. Um, these are the corrosive waters working with NOAA here. This is off the Northeast. Now, this happens to be right over the main bivalve bed that the walruses. That's the last remnant of sea ice hangs right here. So they use it, it's there. They sit on it on Hanischel and they dive down. But you can see seasonally what's happening is having an impact on these clam populations. As far as fish, just one example. This is what happened when the ice completely the, went away. The bottom temperature, they defined it, the cold pool is less than zero degrees C. So then 2010, normally that's cold in the middle section that you see in purple. And that is also air, it's usually slower currents and a lot of organic matter settles out and you have, tend to have a lot of uh, benthic animals uh, there, nowhere near what we have in North because they trawled out the, the bottom there. But what's happened as you move to 217, you can see it contracted. 218, it barely it didn't form the cold pool. And this is the year between 217 winter and 218 that these commercial fish went north. And uh, they feed off of clams and worms and so forth. And then you can see the bottom temps in 219. There was a little bit of a pollinium formation here. But these fish are moving this side of the island, and in this year, both sides of the island. We have a closure on fish commercial fishing north of Bering Strait, but the Russians are commercial fishing on their side of the uh, of the date line there. And so this is a this is kind of a waiting to happen type thing because it's a real issue with coastal communities and the fact that commercial fisheries coming coming north after some of these populations. So that is a uh, the first indication of this northward movement, they are documented already, all these commercial fish on the Barrett Sea on the Atlantic sector side, because they have their ice retreat pull back there, and these fit commercial fish are moving north. So the last thing I would close up is that we do have data meetings, uh, and this one was last December at Victoria, and these are just some of the last people actually decided to take the picture Remember to take the picture on the last day. And some of the folks over <laughs> left. Lesson learned, like the, our Koreans, we are going to this meeting, you notice on the agenda, right at the first break, picture time. So, but anyway, this is where we uh, uh, all do group international. We had a lot of people from the Zoom. We had folks from, from China calling in and other parts of the US and Canada uh, providing their data. So we share the data, try to decide on what publications we're gonna go forward. And this is just one example. They're available on our on our website there, but it, it it's looking at everything from uh, you know physics, chemistry, and plankton that Phyllis at all did work. This is the carbon trap work that Catherine did. Uh, this is a modeler that we're working with from Woods Hole, who's now back in uh, China, who we're actually would be hosting a graduate student come this December. Uh, physical oceanography working with biologists on the top right, video survey leaded, and then this issue of walruses. Um, where they uh, different, how they're separating their carbon inputs, the male and female. So data sets, uh, we have uh, as an NSF funded project, the Arctic data catalog is where all NSF funding in the Arctic uh, is supposed to be posted. We actually have a landing page, uh, the DBO there. So if you go to that portal, there's everything from physics to chemistry to biology from different cruises. Um, we have data links. These are some from, from the NOAA data links, the National Center for Environmental Information, and Alaska Ocean uh, Observing System. There's a big seabird database if you're into seabirds, but it's got 40 years of data there. The NASA link, this is the landing page if you want satellite data and how to get to some of the larger data sets from them. And then the AMBON, uh, another project for uh, biodiversity. And then I would just close out by saying that the concept of this DBO where we set these uh, 
locations of the standard time series and we interact internationally. The, the thing that we have with the Pacific side is every ship that wants to work in the Arctic goes to the Bering Strait. So within the specific Arctic group that we have had it now for I think 15 years, we share where we're gonna go in the cruises, where your data sets, what you're gonna collect, cross-platform, we're trying to do that with early careers some more now, at least leaving some charge on that. And in the process that in the last year, this has caught on, it, it kind of is a slow ramp up in the Atlantic sector, but now as part of this Arctic Passion, which is a network of networks, the building Atlantic DBO over here, combining work in Fram Strait and into the Barents Sea, because they have their commercial fish going north. Uh, we have the, uh, the start of the Davis Strait, Bath and Bay, working with the Canadians, uh, physical oceanography and biology here. And then the meeting Lee was mentioned, we're going to Korea on the, uh, the East Siberian Sea DBO that's developing between Korea and, and the US, built ongoing right from the where Russia ends and international waters begin. Because this particular program, they were doing a lot of work with the Russian colleagues and they couldn't, even before Ukraine, they couldn't get in to the, it's very hard to get into, into, to get into Russian waters and now it's nearly impossible. So they're building, but they can catch that particular thing has to flow a lot of carbon and a lot of the nutrients coming off the shelf right through that region so they can pick it up. There's a, a depression there and so they can pick up their uh, standard stations at that point. So we're looking at, they're looking at new technology, uh, how to put the glider systems in there, these satellite data, how often they're gonna collaborate and share their data. And um, yeah, so this was a, some exciting thing that's been happening in the last six months to a year and just some websites here of the different uh, programs, including ours. So with that, I would just close out by saying that the seasonal and annual DBO lines are showing us transitions. Not only the physical oceanography, we're having faster currents, uh, changing uh, salinity and freshwater patterns going into that uh, system that we're studying. Uh, we're seeing changes in the nutrients, and part of that has to do with the chemistry, uh, this denitrification hotspot further south that we're seeing, and then uh, which has an impact on carbon cycling. Uh, ocean acidification, harmful algal blooms, all these uh, invasive species are all key topics um, and impacting biodiversity in this system and actually pan Arctic and other systems as well. And so we're tracking it on the Pacific side. And then the issue of commercial fisheries, and this is something that particularly for NOAA's involvement uh, to look at the shift in the, in the ecosystem structure. So just again, here's a couple of our observing our, our main website, our data portal, and thanks to all the funding uh, part and international partners that we have, with appropriate logos on there. And uh, that's it. I'm happy to, Lee and I am happy to take questions and uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a question that I have to go to the class. Do you understand correctly that DBO cut the data differently from satellite image, right? So you become more rich data at fixed location, right? Well, what NASA is doing is they, they have their whole, what they're putting on their website is they, they have all the data, you know, the NASA data there. And then what they're doing is run statistics on the DBO locations as, that, as their contribution to our our, our study so they can look at uh, trends and so forth but the the back the basic data that they have all those uh, the broader scale data sets are available. do they collect the same kind of data elements you collect the chemistry you have biology you have to do or oh, not well, they, can, they can collect chlorophyll data but now one of the challenges is that the satellite sensors can only see so far into yeah. the water yeah so yeah. you read paper i mean there are people writing papers saying production is going up, uh, but what we're trying to do is reconcile uh, in July when we're there as a change in those boxes, it doesn't look like it's changed. It does look like we, we can't just prove that produ production has gone up, it probably has. But um, th I think that's a big challenge. The scale is so big from the satellite imagery versus what we're doing, you know, let's stop the ship, do sample like a sample right? yeah yeah it's yeah it's, it's, isn't it possible if you like to strictly like well first of all learn that the relationship between the satellite image and your deep sample yes, like, yes yeah and yeah it's, 
triple yeah, and I and I would say that we have you know one of the things we do is provide all our chlorophyll data as part of this project to NASA because their satellites are seeing the skin right the top five meters yeah. and then they do a, an algorithm to estimate what the subsurface chlorophyll max so what you're seeing in the water column it's all by the by summertime it's it's all at about 25 meters and they're not seeing on the satellite but in order to be able to extrapolate and say what productivity really is. So that's one of the things if we share data with them, they're using it to build these algorithms. And so they keep asking us for those field data sets. And then uh, I think that that has become a valuable collaboration. The other thing they are building on the satellite is looking at these harmful algal blooms and figuring out a way to look at species composition by, by reflectance of the different species. So there's those type of experiments going on. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, I can answer. I have a few questions. One is about the salinity. So, when the fresh water joins from the Rio Grande, do you see a decrease in salinity? And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's. I mean, you wouldn't go out there and drink that water. Yeah. It's it's not fresh. But um, if you do like an end member analysis with the oxygen isotope and the salinity, you can draw where that. Where the salinity reaches zero on a regression line, that'll tell you what the oxygen isotope composition of the water is. And it's uh, the fresh water when you reach zero salinity, it's either going to look like seawater if it made, was made from uh, sea ice that, that melted, or it's going to look like river water. They're really quite a bit different. Uh, and, and it has to do with the world ocean is pretty homogenous in, in terms of the oxygen 18, oxygen 16 ratio. But as you get further and further north, when water goes through evaporation cycles, the heavy isotope gets left behind. So you, you lose more and more of the oxygen 18. So by the time you get to the polar region, it's depleted by a significant amount. And it's very easy to tell this water came from, from, a, from rain or snow. And this water that is going to taste a little salty, but mostly fresh, came from sea ice that melted. So delta eight two they measure like the unit is per mil. Yeah, it's in yeah. per mil. So uh, you know more than I assumed. Uh, the the but yeah, it's a parts per thousand measurement reference to uh, deep sea ocean water is the standard. It's is it's, it's ocean water. Uh, so it's given a value to zero. And when we take water out of the Yukon River, it's minus twenty two. So that's huge because we can make the the precision of the measurements about a tenth of a per mil, so 0 0.1 per mil instead of 20. So it's 200 times uh, the resolution. So it's very easy to tell. So sea ice will look like seawater uh, isotopically in terms of the per mil composition. So for the seawater, delta 16 was worth an 18 state there, maybe. Yeah, so in seawater. Yeah. So yeah, delta 18 will be lower in. Uh, in anything that's gotten, if we measured this water, um, I mean, it's a hydrological tool. It, it, it's altitude, you know. So if this fell as rainwater and then was was in the ground, uh, but started at a high altitude, we can we can tell that too. So there's there's lots of sort of diagnostic tools that. Uh, but where we live here in in Maryland, uh, the waters, you know, it depends when it rains too. Uh, if if the if the moisture came from the Gulf of Mexico. Then it's going to look different than if it came from Canada, like in a Alberta Clipper type snowstorm. Thank you. Yeah. And I think one thing I don't know if you mentioned it that you know we talk about the great big rivers bringing fresh water into the Arctic, but he's always said that you know because of that uh, the oxygen the isotope information that nearly forty percent of what flows through Bering Strait can be considered fresh water, right? Uh, the, well, it's in relation to to yeah, the to yeah, the people. Yeah, yeah. If you look. 10% of the fresh water on earth ends up in rivers that goes into the Arctic Ocean. So, and it's, it's the ocean, Arctic Ocean is really kind of a big branch of the Atlantic Ocean, but it has the biggest continental shelves on earth. Uh, and, and so the biggest proportion of shallow water to deep water. So it's heavily influenced by fresh water, whether that comes from sea ice or from river runoff. And the, and the climate change thing that's happening now, is fresh water is increasing. So we see it in the rivers and we see it in, in this too, that, that downward trend, the green to red, uh, that represents more 
uh, an increase in about 40% in fresh water over the last 25 years uh, flowing through Bering Strait. So that has a big influence. It's going to set up more stratification. Uh, we're interested in what does it do to nutrients because you have to get nutrients into the surface in order for plants. So this idea that production is going to go up because sea ice is going to disappear, the jury's still out on it because um, more fresh water means more stratification, separation. So the plant, the nutrients are down here and the plants are up here where they can see the light, but if there are no nutrients, they're not going to grow anymore. So we, that's an active area that people are, are doing research on. Maybe I can ask a couple of questions. Um, I was curious about a couple of slides down. You had the graph with the different time series, uh, like several parallel time series, I think. Um, this? No, if you keep going. Oh, the other way. No, it, the, other, the, the other way was fine, but just if you keep going. Yeah, right here. Okay. Um, what? So okay. That, that kind of really piqued my interest because um, we do something called as multi domain mining here, mm -hmm. which essentially looks at unrelated data streams mm -hmm. be because the, the connection has not been set up. And I know we have colleagues here who do causality as well. But what we try to find is linkages across different time series. For example, if you have anomalies in one, mm -hmm. do you see anomalies in others as well? And I almost felt like the way you were talking about it, you know, that kind of jogged something for me. So I'm curious, are you trying to find, or is it of an interest to find relationships between sea ice change and the zooplankton change and the chlorophyll and the yes, zooplankton? And I can uh, categorically say yes in there, you know, and that's one thing like to look at the, the some of these times that this time lags in there, like yes. our, our bet, my benthic animals that I study, you know, it may not, this year won't be what the high productivity, but it's one or two or three years down the line, then all of a sudden their biomass picks up or decline. But I mean, looking at disparate time series into something that you were mentioned would be very interesting. Uh, and maybe we, that could be an interesting project offshoot because we have mm -hmm. students who have algorithms that look at these multi domain connections right. and they could easily apply it to some of your mm -hmm. data sets. And I know colleagues who do causality as well could be interesting um, it, relationships yeah. as well. So we have been doing uh, similar stuff with the uh, eyes, looking at uh, time lag, how lag effects are playing out with respect to the ethics. Yeah, because I think one of the one of the things about this is if you look at the upper right, the chlorophyll. So those are the plants, and they respond to when the sea ice disappears, and there is a lag. You know, if you look at the chlorophyll in May. Uh, versus the zooplankton, which normally would be eating the chlorophyll, uh, there's a lag and they don't show up until the middle of the summer. It depends, of course, on the location and the sea ice conditions. Uh, but that's why all of that material falls to the bottom. But, you know, having some predictability about if we have so much chlorophyll on this such and such date, and what's the predicate predecessor conditions in sea ice, then, oh, that'd be really interesting if we could reliably predict if you have a light ice year, you're going to have, say, less chlorophyll and it's going to get to the bottom later. And so, you know, what a what if sort of scenarios as, as things change. Uh, this year, there's more sea ice um, than there's been the last few years, but we've had this sort of oscillating uh, process happen in terms of the sea ice. And it's, it's the long term trend is, is down. I do have another naive question, if you will. Um, you know, we talk about the the melt in the Arctic ice sheets and, you know, the runoff and the discharge, and you've talked about some of the impacts on the biologics. I'm curious, you know, the predictions and the, uh, you know, extrapolations people have made that, you know, in 100 years, if all the ice sheets are gone, what do you foresee happening, you know, if this trend continues? Well, I think one of the things is that we look at What's happening in the southern Bering Sea, which is now they're having maybe can't even go after crab anymore because they they're they're having issues with uh, they, they don't quite know why, but the populations have just uh, uh, gone right. down tremendously. Is that that's more there's no sea ice that's forming south of the of Pribilofs like it used to, and so we see the and, and the biomass used to be higher on the bottom in it with commercial fishing and these other changes is half of what it used to be. 
So the projection would be that system, and we put this in a science paper a decade ago, is that they'll become more like a pelagic system similar to the Southern Bering Sea, but it's, uh, but uh, and the impact will be dramatic for upper trophics that migrate tens of that you know four or five thousand miles, but it's going to you know maybe that there'll be fish populations would go up further north. But eventually they're going to get to the slope and there's, I mean, there's a limit to that. So I think the projection is if you were to go real extreme with no ice, I think it's going to become more pelagic. It'll be more like a temperate ocean and it won't be the productive belt that it has been for the last 50 years. Yeah, they, there are a couple of words that have been invented or people use one, one is borealization. So that's instead of being Arctic or high latitude, it's just Northern. Uh, and, and the other one that's used, particularly Atlantification, that doesn't work in the Pacific, you can't say. So they made a new word, it's Pacific. <laughs> I don't know, but I saw it. Yeah, you know, I, th I think pacification if I'm old enough like with that. the Vietnam War, there's a bad, pacification is a bad word. <laughs> <to> use. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so Atlantification is used. And, yeah. and, and, re and really what I said earlier about the Arctic is just kind of a branch, of, a, a cold branch of the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. So Atlantification just means we're gonna have killer whales. That'll be the the chief predator instead of polar bear. Uh, things of this that, that a lot of those species will move north. And, and I think that yeah, for the the Norwegians and uh, the Barents Sea, there's fishing has moved north. And in they in the U.S., north. fishing has moved north, and it it imposed some economic costs because the port the port is in the Aleutian Islands, and so they have to sail for us. further. Yeah, for us and. Probably for Norway too. Uh, they sail from Tromso to catch Atlantic cod, and the Atlantic cod are further north than they used to be. I, I maybe I have one quick follow up. You know how there is this uh, formation of these atmospheric rivers that's yes. creating all kind of havoc, and then you're seeing all these plant uh, algae movement in Florida. That huge mass. That oh yeah, sargassum. Yeah. yeah. Are are those types of effects? You're going to see more of those types of effects. Well, there've been atmospheric rivers. Yeah. Uh, I mean, all the news has been about it in in uh, California this year, but they've also affected Alaska. There's some record amount of snow uh, uh, you know, on the ground in Alaska now. Um, the sargassum, I don't know enough about that to say that that's a climate change. It, the sargassum is is a seaweed that uh, doesn't have to be fixed to uh, the seafloor, and it floats in the sargassum. See, and it, yeah, giant. and it's a giant patch. And I went to Bermuda, I think, in January one year, and it was like, gosh, it's all over the place on the beach there. So I think Florida's just, and I, I think I was, I was in Texas a few years back too, and it was washing ashore on the beach, and it's a big problem because they want pristine, clean beaches that yeah. don't smell, so, so the yeah. tourists will come. So I, I think Florida is so dependent upon tourism yeah. that. Uh, that's that's bad news. So. Yeah, so I don't know if it's clear with the change in currents, you know, or warming or a life cycle of those that sargassum that eventually. Yeah. I guess you could make the case it might it might be nutrients. I I don't know. I'd have to read up some more yeah. as to what the cause is or just just the way the wind's blowing. Now it's coming to Florida. It's their turn. But I think <laughs> there's clear cases of what's happening for the ecosystem up here. And the other thing to remember is that a lot of I, we have these rich zooplankton and benthos because we have under I see ice algae. Which you're not going to have if the ice pulls back completely. You don't have that kick punch that you have in the spring. It gets the life cycle going. It'll become more traditionally like the the temperate and the diatom species are changing. So instead of being nice fat lipid ones, they're going to be skinnier, well skinnier, but you know they're lipid less uh, reduced than that. Because there was a time when there's a major die off in the Bering Sea. These coccolithophores just build calcium carbonate. They're very very tiny, and the birds they couldn't. Get the, the zooplankton couldn't feed on them and the birds couldn't feed on the zooplankton. There was a crash going on. So there's these species that are changes that can have impacts all the way up the trophies. And it's that's tied to form. So there's a class in here. Sorry, we have it. Okay, oh, we're, oh, we're, we're, yes, it's time. Yes, sure yes, about. yes. Move to the conference room. Yes, thank you so much. For yeah, the oh, you're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome.